Please rewind this cassette. The, the other important joke for me is one that's uh, usually attributed to Groucho Marx, but I think it appears originally in Freud's wit and its relation to the unconscious. And it goes like this, I'm paraphrasing. Um, I would never want to belong to any club that would have someone like me for a member. I guess I've been building up to this for a really long time, but I've been thinking about this movie so much the last couple of weeks that I guess it was just time to talk about it and talk about the filmmaker in general. If you don't know, like a lot of young film buffs and aspiring artists out there, especially in the United States, although he's also very popular in France and the UK, I'm a fan of Woody Allen. I'm a hardcore fan of Woody Allen. In fact, Woody Allen might be my favorite director of all time. He's arguably one of the greatest writers of the 20th century, and I don't say that lightly. However you feel about him and his personal life and the questionable decisions he's made over his very long career, I don't know how he can't be looked at as anything but a national treasure. I mean, who else has contributed so many screenplays and different types of movies and introduced us to so many great actors and characters over these years. I mean, really, he's kind of in a category of his own, even above filmmakers like Francis Ford Coppola and Scorsese and all sorts of guys that we just praise and hold up to a high standard. None of them have the length of a filmography as Woody Allen, and none of them have as many great films as Woody Allen. Woody Allen has, I think you could argue, 15 to 20 great films then a few good films, and then quite a few bad films. I mean, the guy's made like almost 50 movies or something, and to be fair, his recent work outside of Midnight in Paris and Blue Jasmine hasn't been that great either. But this dude had a run. He had a run that is so goddamn legendary, I can't believe it even happened. Coming off the success of Annie Hall in Manhattan, Interiors was in between there, by the way, Woody hit this run in the 80s that starts with uh, Stardust Memories, and then just goes from one movie after another. I mean, you're talking Zelig, which is way ahead of its time. You're talking Broadway Danny Rose. You're talking Purple Rose of Cairo. Huh, they both have Rose in the title. Whatever. You're talking Crimes and Misdemeanors at the end of this decade. Radio Days, which is one of the greatest coming-of-age historical films ever made. But in the middle of all this... Woody made a film that is often considered, if not his best work, his second best work, or his third best work, depending on who you talk to. For me personally, it's his best movie, and there's several reasons for that, but I think you know what I'm talking about here, Hannah and Her Sisters. For a while, this was Woody's most successful film until Midnight in Paris came out. The film won three Academy Awards for Best Screenplay, Supporting Actor, and Supporting Actress. Many people argue it deserved to win Best Picture that year over Platoon. I would argue that, even though Platoon's one of my favorite movies, but Hannah and Her Sisters is one of the great American films, one of the masterpieces out of American cinema, and really stands out in the 80s when there wasn't a lot of films that I would call masterworks. Not saying I don't love stuff like Die Hard, and I know Raging Bull came out in 1980, but Hannah and Her Sisters has the quality of a novel. It is sprawling. You not only get a sense of this world, a sense of time passing, it takes place over a year in between two Thanksgivings, you really get to know the people in it, and I mean all of them in this ensemble, and you just don't get to know them on the outside. You really get in their heads. There's a use of voiceover in this movie, and it's not like one character's the narrator. All of the characters at one point or another have a voiceover. I mean, I don't think every character in the movie does, but... Michael Caine gets scenes where he gets to talk. Woody Allen as Mickey has scenes where he gets to talk. Uh, Hannah, played by Mia Farrow. So it's called Hannah and Her Sisters because Hannah, played by Mia Farrow, and her two sisters, Lee, played by Barbara Hershey, who I'm a big fan of, and then Diane Weist, who plays Holly, who won an Oscar for this role. Um, It's kind of about their family and the people that are connected to them. Once again, it has a novel-like quality in that way, that structure. Woody plays Mickey, who's the ex-husband of Hannah, and he's kind of going through an existential crisis. Well, he's not kind of going through an existential crisis. The motherfucker's going through a crisis. He he can't seem to figure out what he really feels about God, what he really feels about the afterlife, what he feels about existence. Now, this has been throughout all of Woody Allen's works. Woody Allen is very much an outspoken atheist. Uh, He is a skeptic. He does not believe in God. 
I think he's made it very clear, and I'm not saying that as a criticism. This is just throughout Woody Allen's work. He was very influenced by Bergman. Bergman was his biggest inspiration, what he aspired to be. Woody often talks about the fact that he wishes he could have done tragedy more than comedy, but the comedies always did well, and then every time he tried to make a serious film, it didn't do as well. Like, Interiors kind of failed in between Annie Hall and Manhattan. And Bergman's films are often about the silence of God. I mean, it's a running theme throughout them. And even when you look at Woody's composition, his framing, his lighting, you could just see what he took from Bergman. I mean, he parodies the seventh seal at the end of Love and Death. So he's not being subtle about it, which I give him credit for. He could just act like he wasn't influenced. But Woody has a lot of influences. And I love his early work. I love Take the Money and Run. I love Bananas. I love Sleeper. Love and Death is a brilliant comedy. But he did evolve to another level when he worked with cinematographer Gordon Willis on Annie Hall. He just became a better filmmaker, a more sophisticated director, and not just this brilliant comedy writer that was kind of like in a Mel Brooks category. He took himself to another level where he just became one of the great contemporary artists. So Hannah and Her Sisters, the reason I love it so much is that I think it's all of the things that make Woody Allen great in one movie. Uh, It's the tragedy, it's the drama... It's the in-depth exploration of humanity and why we're here. It's hilarious. It has a bunch of great one-liners. It's got a bunch of great set pieces. It's told in a non-linear fashion at points. There's flashbacks, and then we come back to the current day. We jump ahead in time. Uh, We kind of just go around a bunch of characters. Really, the film shouldn't be very coherent, but because these little vignettes work as almost like little short stories or short films on their own for each actor and the character they're playing, he somehow gets away with it. It's his most epic film in many ways, but it's also one of his most uh, well-structured and put-together screenplays. This film is cohesive. It's very cohesive, and the big point is that it's emotionally cohesive. Woody isn't that happy with this movie. He often talks about, and I'll try to put the interview in here, He is not happy with how Manhattan turned out, which is considered one of his greatest movies, and he's not happy with how he ended Hannah and Her Sisters, because he really did want this to be a tragedy. Spoilers, but Michael Caine's character, Elliot, which is now married to Hannah, wants to cheat on her with her sister, Lee, and he desires her. I mean, the movie starts with this at Thanksgiving. He's talking about how just infatuated with her he is, and a big part of the movie is him pursuing her. And also that, that, you know, Woody Allen's character, Mickey, finds out that he possibly has a brain tumor and he's going to die. So now he's really trying to find religion. And there's there's so many hilarious scenes with that that it goes beyond. AIU did a really good video called Woody Allen the Atheist where he puts together clips from different Woody Allen movies. And a big chunk of it is dedicated to Hannah and her sisters, which I would highly recommend that video if you kind of just want to get a view on on Woody's uh, look at God. But Woody said that he didn't feel like he earned what he wanted originally, which was a tragic ending, which was Elliot just still yearning for her at the end, and Mickey not being very happy. But if you know, if you've seen the movie, it ends with Mickey going to see the Marx Brothers at a theater, and he hangs out with his niece a lot, and he kind of says, you know, life's not all bad, there's good things in that, and he said, which isn't really true. So he feels like Crimes and Misdemeanors, which is two movies going on parallel from each other, a Woody Allen comedy and this serious film with Martin Landau about murder and infidelity, and then those two narrative comes together, he feels like that was more successful. Now, I love Crimes and Misdemeanors, and I can even get Woody's point to a degree that Hannah and her sisters, maybe he feels like it was building towards a tragedy and he didn't earn it, so he had to rewrite the ending, redo the ending where it has a more optimistic note. The final scene at the Thanksgiving a year later is extremely optimistic, especially for a Woody Allen film. I mean, you might go in expecting Purple Rose of Cairo, but I think Woody Allen endings can be bittersweet. I think Annie Hall has a very bittersweet ending, and I would disagree with him. See, he's acting like that he wrote this happy ending that it's so obvious and it was so effortless for him to write a happy ending to make the audience feel complete that it wasn't worth it, and that he was kind of being disingenuous. He was manipulating us. But I think what he misses is that there is a point in here that, yeah, if God doesn't exist, which is kind of what I think, and if overall the universe doesn't care about us and life is sort of meaningless, uh, you just have to find happiness in what is here while you're living it. 
You have to find happiness in movies. You have to find happiness in art and love. And you're going to hurt a lot, but you're also going to feel a lot of joy. He says that it isn't true, but that's not really the case. I mean, yes, you die alone. And I'm sure Woody still doesn't want to die. I don't want to die. And, you know, I don't think that ever goes away for certain people. I think some people always just fear death so much they let it consume them. But I, I don't know. I think he's ignoring that what makes this movie so beautiful is that it could be tragic. But it kind of says that life isn't always tragic. Sometimes life is okay. And then it goes again, and then it sort of becomes tragic again. I mean, it's hills and valleys. There's a reason that's an expression. So I think it's beautiful this ends on a, on a positive note, because that's, that's part of life. You, you come to conclusions, and where this ends, everyone's kind of at a happier place in their life. But there's still secrets they're keeping from each other. There's still lies being held between people. There's still scars. It's just everyone's kind of ignoring it and trying to move on. And, and I love that about the movie. But Woody does seem to think of it as a compromise. I don't really agree. So let's just break down what's so, what's so great about things in this movie. There's scenes in it that are so funny that they're laugh out loud funny. You wouldn't even think Michael Caine could play a character like this, and he's brilliant. Then there's scenes that are moving and beautiful and poetic and graceful and so well shot and edited and put together that it's kind of mind-boggling. It's like Woody's outdoing himself. There's a scene with Max von Sydow and Barbara Hershey where they kind of have a breakup. They don't kind of have a breakup. They have a fucking breakup. And he's an older professor, and she was like his pupil, and it's this intellectual thing. And him and her just go back and forth in the scene, and it's brilliant. I mean, it's like great drama, great writing, terrific acting. The acting is off the charts. And at this level, he reaches the heights of Bergman in that scene. And then he'll go to a scene where Daniel Stern comes over to Max von Sydow's apartment, which just would have been earlier in the movie, to buy art, but he just wants to buy it off size. He just wants stuff to cover up his walls. He really doesn't care about the artwork. That, that's also just funny and a commentary on, on the vapid nature of, of the art community and people who buy art and what they think about it. And while that scene's going on, Michael Caine is sort of trying to manipulate things to get with Barbara Hershey uh, while her boyfriend is there. There's so many things going on in every scene. Every scene is layered. I mean, it's like you have a scene that starts off kind of funny, kind of a situational sitcom-esque situation. But then what Alan does is it slowly transitions into something uh, darker. And you start to think, wow, these, these characters actually have a dynamic here I wasn't aware of. And then he takes a twist and the scene goes somewhere else you weren't expecting it to go. And it kind of transcends and becomes uh, life-affirming or kind of changes how you see your relationships with your own family or friends or what you do. For instance, uh, it's established that Mickey's character cannot uh, he cannot have children. His, his sperm is no good. So you get these flashbacks where him and Hannah have to go ask his friend, who he's kind of been in competition with in the television business, uh, to donate sperm so she can get... Pregnant. So the kids that he has with her aren't really his kids. And it's this emasculating situation where this guy who feels superior to him and competitive to him gives the sperm. It's almost like he's getting cucked or something, even though this is very normal for friends to do this and help people out. It's almost like he lost something in the power dynamic between them in this moment. And it's a very pathetic scene. And there's things like that you don't really expect it to go that way. And it just makes you care about Mickey more. But he's also sort of wallowing in his own misery and you're like dude just get your shit together and then funny scenes where he tries to be a Harry Krishna and then he tries to be Catholic and he comes home and he has a bag and he pulls out bread he pulls out bread and groceries after he pulls out a bible and a cross J just great stuff like that and all of the flashbacks all of these these stories is for instance uh Carrie Fisher Princess Leia herself and Holly's character going with um Shit, the guy from the Killing Fields in Law and Order. Sam Watterson, I believe is his name. He takes them all around the city to show them different buildings. He's an architect, and it's sort of like a date with two women at the same time. And both women want him, and they don't really know he's going to choose. And then it's just this really fun scene. It is a fun, romantic, nice, pleasant scene. And then it ends with, you know, both women trying to get him to take them home. And Holly loses in this situation, and he leaves with Carrie Fisher. And it's just it's just moments like that feel so true to life, but they also 
they also sting a little bit in that, you know, there's times where you're the loser. There's times when you fail and you're not the winner and you have to have some perspective. But then there's also times when you get little victories, but they don't last very long. Like, uh, cause this is a spoiler review, but Mickey finds out that he doesn't have cancer. There's a scene that plays with that where he is told he has cancers and then he comes back to reality to find out he's okay. And he's running down the street, jumping up in joy, jumping up and down and dancing. Like, I'm going to be alive. I'm going to be alive. And then he stops for a second. He's like, wait, fuck. Only for right now am I going to be alive. I'm still going to die. And he's ranting about this. He's like, I'm, go I'm going to die. You know, I'm going to die. What am I supposed to do? And she's telling him, as, as, uh, this woman who works with him, like, what, you just became aware of that now? I mean, of course you're going to die. Why are you dealing with this now? So he, it, it even makes his life worse. You know, he, he was facing death. He was going to kill himself. And then he finds out he's not going to die. And he's only happy for a few seconds before the awareness of his inevitable death hits him again. And he, and he has to come to this happy point again. I think if the film ended more tragically and sad and it looked at these things as meaningless or that there was no hope at the end, I don't know. I think it would just be a very cynical movie. And I don't like to think about it that way because it still has truths in it. Hannah goes back to visit her parents who are fighting and it feels like there's tension and that they're kind of past their prime. And then the father starts to play piano and you get this beautiful voiceover and these images of pictures of them over the years and what they used to be like he was dashing she was beautiful they had their whole lives ahead of them and now they kind of live in this mausoleum that they've built for themselves uh just beautiful beautiful work uh mickey arguing with his parents about what happens after you die and consciousness and 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 why do bad things happen you know and his dad i think is like taking a shit and he's like what what do you mean why do i know why there were nazis i don't fucking know i don't know if woody's message in his work has ever had more clarity i think you could argue that there's just as much clarity especially in the end of crimes and misdemeanors but this film throughout it you really get a sense of how how woody feels about the world and New York almost takes a back seat to this as opposed to some of his other films, even though he's still using it as, as brush strokes. It sort of takes a back seat to the, the characters and the psychology of these situations. And I mean, think about all the things he's dealing with here past relationships, uh, cheating on the one you're with, changing your mind about how you feel about somebody, you know, not loving them anymore, not really understanding where your love is how much love you have to give and why love is fleeting and then it can come back for someone else after you lost it before isn't that interesting or do people think about me as much as i think about them because i'm sure you've all had this in your life there's a lot of the time where you're thinking about people you you almost obsess about people then maybe you don't even know that well or you know sort of casually and you wonder do they go home and think about me do they think or maybe they don't think about you at all hannah and her sisters is really getting into that you know, the, the, the things that people do when they're away from you, and do we all care as much? I would say that Lee doesn't care about Elliot's character very much until he, you know, starts being aggressive with her and saying, hey, you know, I, I got this poem for you, I, uh, or I want you to read this poem that, that makes me think about you, and I love you, and I'm passionate for you, and then she's excited and feels out of control, which is sort of the feeling of falling in love. And then to also have a movie dealing with, you know, death, and, and, and yeah, like, what do I do with that information that I'm getting older? And what do I have to leave behind? And is, is my life really been worth it at all? Um, but the movie ends on a moment that's sort of like a miracle, that something does happen. It's, it's, it's got religious allegory to it if you want to read into it. But the last scene with the new life coming into the world, and it seemed, and I, from what I assume, this, this has happened even though it, we've been told this couldn't happen with two characters who have both been at the low point in the story in many ways are both reaching this new level of uh, happiness. I, I think there's something, there's something kind of beautiful about that, that Woody's saying that the reality of life is horrible, but there's miracles in life, things that just happen that I'm not saying are God or anything like that, things that we just don't understand. And there's something sort of beautiful about that. And that can that can get you through uh, the pain of it all. But this sounds like I'm talking about a really depressing movie. This is a very fun movie. This is a movie very much filled with life and joy and opportunity and moments. I think that films like The Royal Tenenbaums took a lot from this. 
I feel like recent Noah Baumbach films have taken a bit from this. I mean, this is a very influential film in the same way Annie Hall is. Annie Hall defined what the romantic comedy had to be when you're really look at it, looking at it from a meta, self-aware point of view. Hannah and Her Sisters is like, this is how you do the ensemble uh, rom-com with dramatic elements. This is how you do this kind of movie from this point on. And I think any filmmaker, particularly New York filmmakers who have tried to do something like this, pull from Hannah and Her Sisters because you hope you could write something as beautiful as this. Woody Allen isn't the happiest guy in the world, although I think he's happier than he makes himself out to be. And like I said, his movies aren't all great. He's made some he's made some duds. He's made some movies that I hate, and I've watched all of them. I really don't like that Larry David one, whatever works. But when he's on point, when he's hitting on all cylinders, what's so great about his work is that it could be so entertaining and so enjoyable and so funny. Like, he doesn't want it to be funny, but it is. He's very funny. We like the early funny ones. And then he still ends up leaving you with a message that, that kind of makes you think a little bit. He did that with Midnight in Paris. It's this very entertaining time travel story. Then it becomes a commentary on nostalgia and learning to live in the moment instead of being so preoccupied in the past that you think in your head was better, but it probably wasn't better. Everybody back then just wanted to live in another era too. So why not make the era you live in now be great? Why do you have to focus so much on something that you don't even really understand? All of his films look at the, the the tragedy and beauty of life. Purple Rose of Cairo is a great example of this, where it just ends, it just rips your fucking heart out. But Hannah and her sisters, I think, maybe even if he didn't intentionally mean for it to be such, maybe if this wasn't his goal as a director with all of these great scenes and this, this tapestry he's painted, I feel like what he has done here that's so p powerful is this is an, this is a, an ode to the, to the human spirit, to the human soul, if you will, a poem to resilience and how life goes on. And in its, in its moments of, of sheer beauty, the complexity of, of human feeling. And I think A.O.L. Scott said this once, the critic, that uh, movies sometimes show us that we think so much because we feel so deeply. And I think Hannah and her sisters really captures that, that we all think about everything in life so much because we feel feelings so deeply that we're trying to understand them and, and process them in the way that we can. But when you do have moments of beauty, when you are able to let yourself go and not be uh, held up in this cage, not be not be held back by, by the pains, and, and you, you're able to find just these moments, like I said, of, of poetry. And, 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 and it's kind of this, if this was a novel, these are some of Woody's finest prose uh, that he's ever written, you know, this is prose as a filmmaker here. And, and it just, it's, it's just great. I mean, it's really hard not to say there's just too many praise. There's too much praise to give this movie. But what I'm trying to say is that I don't think he realized what he actually made here and he can't see it maybe because it's not the film he wanted to make. It's not what he had in his head or what he was doing when he was writing it. He's just made a, a wonderful tribute to uh, when human beings and our humanity, our consciousness, when it can just be something much deeper and and much more more of a respite to all of this, and we can enjoy life, and we and we can enjoy it so much in that moment, and it's so powerful and so beautiful, and I just love that about it. It always makes me feel like. Like there, there's more to me than than I think, and it always makes me have more empathy for the people around me and the people in my life, and that we're all sort of going through the same thing, and we all feel the same things. We just don't talk about it. And Hannah and Her Sisters is just a wonderful piece of uh, of American cinema. And like I said, feel what you will about Woody Allen, but uh, he is one of the great artists of our time. This is one of the great films of the later part of the 20th century. And if you haven't seen it, you're really doing yourself a disservice. And uh, there's just, yeah, it's just great. It's just absolute marvelous film. I love it. This is one of my 10 favorite movies of all time. So I could talk about it for hours. This is legitimately one of my 10 favorite movies. And I've seen a lot of movies. Not bragging, I've just watched a lot of movies. And this blew me away when I first saw it when I was, I don't know, 13, 14. And I've loved it ever since. And I try to watch it every year it's something like my dinner with andre it just it just uh the philosophy of it and 
I just keep going back to. And uh, thank you, Woody. Maybe you're a piece of shit. I don't know. I'm mixed on all that stuff. You might be a piece of shit, but thank you for making a film that lets me know that uh, that that there is there is meaning in life, even if you don't want to see it, Woody. There is a meaning in life, and uh, in those moments when you feel that meaning, goddamn, if if living isn't worth it. Your slightest look easily will unclose me. Though I have closed myself as fingers, you open always, petal by petal, myself as spring opens, touching skillfully, mysteriously, her first rose. I do not know what it is about you that closes and opens. Only something in me understands. The voice of your eyes is deeper than all roses. Nobody, not even the rain, has such small hands. <laughs>